Reluctor was a very good counterpoint to Daredevil. What Daredevil lacked was the relationship to a villain or a villainess or another character that was his counterpoint, that was his the yang to his ying, if I could say, the Doctor Doom to the FF. Um, and when Frank created uh, Electra, I had not, I don't think that I necessarily uh, saw her as the pivotal character that she was uh, uh, going to become in, in a few issues. She became a very important part of the Daredevil mythology very quickly. When we started drawing Elektra initially, we were trying to figure out what she actually looked like. And at some points she had a bit of an Asian feel to her. And I think that at a certain point we were trying to, uh, both Frank and I were feeling our way around uh, the character. And eventually we, we wound up with uh, the, the Caucasian Electra that we know today. I remember that um, I used Catherine Hepburn, a young Catherine Hepburn, as a, that kind of a prototype for her at a certain point. And when she took the hood off, uh, I think in Daredevil, I guess 190 or 191, that was a very Catherine Hepburn kind of face with those high cheekbones. One of the things I particularly enjoyed about Elektra, which I think a lot of the uh, current writers or some, some writers have missed, is that uh, she enjoyed and took pleasure in being bad. She was the progenitor or she was the forerunner in a lot of ways to the bad girl uh, stereotype that has become very, very popular in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, Frank was smart enough, I think, or intuitive enough to uh, come up with a character that was a you know, bad girl uh, very early on. When we were doing uh, Daredevil, um, Frank had the ability to surprise uh, not only the readers, but uh, the people in the office and, uh, and myself included. And I think that um, when we did the issue uh, where she was uh, killed by Bullseye, I was as surprised as anybody else who read the book, you know, a month or two later. It seemed to me to be very, very shocking. Uh, I was shocked that, that we were going to kill Electra, and if memory serves me correctly, uh, obviously, in, in, uh, she's come back, you know, but we were intent on killing her and, and leaving her dead. My memory of issue 190 when she was resurrected, my memory of it was that um, we were uncertain, uh, we meaning uh, Frank, I, and the uh, editor at the time, were uncertain about the prospect of bringing her back and a bit uncomfortable about it. And I think that there was talk, my, if memory serves me correctly, I think that there was talk about her resurrection as a metaphor for her character change and that she indeed was not physically resurrected. Um, I think that that probably became a little too complicated and convoluted. The whole bit about her climbing up the mountain that opened up that story and then closed that story when she actually reached the top of the mountain symbolized her change, that she perhaps was no longer as evil as she was and that she had somehow become a bit more virtuous, which was again symbolized by her white costume rather than a red costume. I think that we eventually settled on the fact that she was literally and physically resurrected. Um, but in the midst of the discussion, we were producing material, and I think it perhaps it was a bit unclear um, because of the time constraints and because of the discussions that we were having about what actually we wanted to do. There was demand to bring her back and, and Marvel at the time wanted to bring her back. 
These are some of the uh, original pages that I still have left from uh, from Daredevil and from Elektra. Um, this is this is uh, Frank Miller's um, layouts for uh, Daredevil. Is it uh, 190 page four? Uh, so this is what I would get at this point. Uh, we were already toward the end of our uh, evolution in terms of working. Um, this is what I would get from Frank, and this is the way he wrote the story. He would actually uh, put the dialogue in with the little drawings. Turning out a monthly book would be pretty impossible if one person did uh, penciling, inking, and coloring, and lettering, you know, or, and writing, you can throw that in too. When I was working on Daredevil, it was highly unusual for one or two people to do the entire book on a monthly schedule for three years, uh, or three, more than three years. That's a track record that I think uh, uh, both Frank and I are very proud of. Uh, we were able to turn out quality work on a timely basis, uh, sometimes in a ridiculous short amount of time. Frank would actually write the story this way. He would draw and write it, I think, at pretty much the same time. I don't think he works this way now. I think he actually does a script without the art. But at that point in, in our uh, evolution at Daredevil, uh, he was he was doing these eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper. This is a Xerox. This is not the original. His originals were in pencil, um, so I would get the uh, Xerox like this. Obviously, a penciler has the responsibility of laying out and designing a page and composing the images within the panel. Uh, an inker does not have that responsibility, but an inker uh, does share the responsibility of communicating visually so that an inker uh, can identify certain textures, identify certain uh, landmarks, uh, clarify the storytelling by placing blacks. An inker is supposed to know about black and white relationships, black and white composition. So I would get the Xerox like this uh, from the office. Uh, you know, it would go through uh, the editor and then the editor would give it to me. I'd pick this up and then I would sit down and draw it on the board and this is the actual original page uh, to the board. And this is, uh, this is the zipper tone that we've been talking about, you know, uh, the, the uh, acetate with the dot patterns on it. Um, and you can see the evolution of it. Um, these pages actually here, uh, this, is the, this is what we would color. Uh, and these are, um, I would always ask for more than one copy because I was trying different things and I would make dif you know, different mistakes. Um, or different corrections, different adjustments. I've thought that inking is literally divided into two parts. Um, one part is what's in the person's head. You know, the look, the theory, the philosophy behind inking. And then the second part is the facility that the uh, inker has in his hands. This is a page which I particularly like, which I saved from, uh, looks like Daredevil 183. You know, there's something about Frank's layouts and Frank's design. Uh, uh, when he's good, he's very, very, very good. And here's another use of Zipatone, which is just to uh, isolate texture and give it, give it some noticeability and give it a way of popping out and way of clarifying some storytelling. I use a, a, a Raphael number four brush and I use a Hunts 103 mapping pen point, and that's all I use. I don't use uh, felt tips, I don't use markers, I don't use uh, rot rings, I don't use mechanical pens. I like the feel of a brush and a pen a tip. And I will use other things, you know, to, to um, uh, develop and, and introduce texture. I'll use cloth and sponges, and I've inked with sticks and, you know, tried to experiment with all sorts of different tools. Um, but a brush and a pen tip is basically, uh, you know, my mom and dad, I think. Gray is a tone that is impossible to achieve in, in, in four-color uh, comics. Nowadays, because of Photoshop, uh, there isn't any problem. But I loved using Zip as a color, so I'm sure that I did not color this uh, and focused instead on um, the main uh, character or the main event that's happening in the panel, which is Daredevil. This is an example of the graded zip that I would often use. Trying to explain what an inker does to a layman, the best example that I can come up with is that the penciler 
does one version of the art. The inker does another version of the art. And try to imagine if both versions were on film or on translucent paper and you put them together on top of each other, that's the finished product. That's essentially the relationship between a penciler and an inker, I think. This is the beginning of, you can see the, actual, which I just love, um, the actual color of the coloring that I was doing at the time. I, you know, I probably dropped on it, uh, dropped some spots on it. And then, of course, as a result, could not use the page, so I put these pages aside. This is the layout that I would get from Frank. And you can see how closely the finished uh, product uh, looked from uh, from the uh, layout. Comics in a lot of ways is like piecing a puzzle together uh, and this to me was a very very enjoyable puzzle. Uh, one of the things that I really like is lighting and and I know that I probably used a photograph for this particular shot so uh, Frank you know uh, Frank had a particular lighting in mind I didn't think it, it uh, that I could do it well or I didn't think that it worked well um, so I changed the lighting a little bit without changing the message of the panel. Uh, you can see that, you know, introducing some blacks into the panel. Um, this is a very Wally Wood influence. Wally Wood was a big influence of mine. You know, the shadow that's underneath it giving you some solidity in terms of, you know, where they stand. Um, even this particular black here, up here. Um, you know, designing. I love designing. I love composing. I love uh, directing the reader's eye. To be able to do Electra again, you know, whether it's in a Daredevil series or in Wolverine, is is a is an absolute joy. She is she's a terrific, fun, fun character to work with, um, and I know in my heart that um, I will return to both Daredevil and Electra until you know, I drop. This is the, uh, a scene from uh, Daredevil 190 where uh, Elektra is going through her training with Stick. It's great stuff. You know, I look at it and I'm amazed, at, uh, uh, frankly, at how good it is and how good we were. <laughs>